excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Amen, amen. And I know, I know you probably just sat down and got comfortable. Or you're about to sit down. Don't sit down just yet. Let's stand together. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we're going to take some needs to the Lord tonight. Our ushers are going to get ready to receive our Wednesday night tithes and offering as well. But we want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want to remember Brother Walton. Good to see you tonight, sir. We're praying for you, a continued recovery. So good to see you out and about. We want to remember the Denby family. We want to remember Mary Cooper. So many needs. We want to remember our group of senior high students that are at Youth Congress this week. They are, uh, in fact, they're in service right now in St. Louis uh, for the North American Youth Congress. And oh, please pray for the chaperones, definitely. Uh, but they're going to have a great time, and I know God is going to move on them, and they're going to come back changed and refreshed and renewed in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Would you just lift your hands right now, whatever the need is, would you just tell God, I trust you tonight. Would you let that be your prayer right now? Lord, right now over everything that is going on, the things I have faced, the things that are yet to come in my life, Lord, no matter what the situation is, God, I trust you with every single thing. God, I trust you with every physical need, every financial need, job situation. If it's a, if it's a family uh, issue or, or family matter, God, I trust you tonight. I put it in your hands, Lord. You are the great physician. There is none like you. There's none beside you. There's no name like your name tonight. We speak faith into every situation. We speak healing, God. We speak life. We speak peace into chaos tonight. Lord, anoint our classes, our our POL kids, our students tonight, anoint the senior high, the youth congress services going on, Lord. Minister to those students tonight and let your presence be in this place tonight in this worship center. Anoint our adult class, our minds, Lord, anoint our hearts, Lord, to hear the word. But not just to hear it, but to receive it, Lord. And Lord, we pray over this offering tonight. Bless it and use it for your purpose is our prayer that everyone should have a chance to hear this wonderful life-changing, life-saving God gospel message is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. And P-O-L said amen. amen, amen. You can be seated. The ushers are coming by to receive our Wednesday night, our midweek tithes and offering. And while they're doing so, excuse me, while they're doing so, I want to remind you all of a few things that are happening around the P-O-L and around the campus over the next uh, week or so. Tomorrow is Thursday. That means it's our weekly prayer and fast day, and uh, we encourage our entire church to take Thursdays as, as a day to join with your church family in a day of consecrated prayer and fasting. And we know that not everyone is able to do a complete fast. There's dietary restrictions, medical restrictions. We understand that. But in some way, shape, or form, however you can do it, uh, we encourage you to join with your church family. There's power in unity. Amen. And when the church is unified together, miraculous things happen. The devil doesn't like unity. He doesn't like it. But God blesses unity. And we're going to be a unified church. Sunday. Everybody say Sunday. Sunday, Sunday is the fifth at five worship. So that means there will be no classes, no service, no activities here on campus Sunday morning. You're welcome to come to campus. You just won't be able to get in. You can have church in the parking lot if you want to. Uh, but no one will be here. So take Sunday morning off, get your grass cut if you want, sit in your PJs all day, I don't know. I just enjoy your Sunday morning, and we're going to meet here Sunday evening at 5 p.m. for a worship service, and we're going to have a great time. And then after the worship service on Sunday evening, we are encouraging our church family to join us at Dino's on Bertrand for dinner following service. You're more than welcome to join us. You don't have to, but you are welcome to. And we would love to have an opportunity to just sit and have some dinner and hang out and fellowship with our church family. It's, good. it's important that we stay connected, not just in the church, but outside of the church as well, and develop those godly Christian relationships. It's going to be a great time Sunday evening. And the next Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the month. First Wednesday of August, that means it's First Wednesday worship, and uh, if you were not here Sunday, I want to remind you that if you are able to do so, and if you consider yourself a member of the POL, 
please make sure you're here next Wednesday night. Got a special message for this church that God placed on my heart about a month ago. And uh, I believe that God is going to be challenging this church, taking us to another level. Uh, it's a new season. Uh, August and September is always a new season of, of the year. It's new school se- new school year. We're getting ready to close out the year, and we're already already planning for Christmas. And uh, we were in a store the other day, and Christmas stuff is already out. Uh, and we're not even at Thanksgiving. We're not even, school hadn't even started, and they've got Christmas trees out. And, uh, but this is the time of the year that the year begins to change, and people try to refocus things with school starting. And, and I think the church needs to do the same thing. So make sure you're here next Wednesday night at 7. And then the next weekend following that, August 5th and 6th, is our back-to-school weekend. Uh, that means it's our back-to-school bash on Saturday uh, at 10 a.m. for the POL kids. And then Sunday morning uh, at 9 a.m. our classes and 10 a.m. our back-to-school service. And we're going to be having some help uh, during that service from our POL kids, our students, helping us lead worship and lead the service that day. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we're going to be praying over all the, new, all the students. Uh, if you're a teacher, principal, uh, any type of administrator or faculty in our school system, we are going to be praying over the school year. And if you have a friend or family member that, is, that fits that criteria, invite them to come with you and worship on Sunday, and we're going to pray over the school year. I believe this is going to be the great, greatest school year for God's people and God's students, God's teachers that we've ever seen. I believe that, amen? I believe revival is in our schools, amen? I believe miracles, signs, and wonders can follow God's people outside of the church And I believe in the cafeteria, God can heal people. I believe sitting in the lounge, in the faculty lounge, with teachers eating lunch, God can move and teachers can receive the Holy Ghost in the lounge at Acadiana High School. Do you believe that? Or Southside or Lafayette, you name it, God has already taken care of it. He's already got it ready for us. He said, I just need laborers for the, for the revival. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm excited about where this church is at. I'm excited about the future. And I'm excited about tonight as we continue our Blueprint series. We've been going through the book of Acts talking about how God built his church. And the same formula that saw the book of Acts church multiply, it still works today. It still works today. And tonight you have the privilege and the honor of hearing from Brother Austin Ofter. I love this guy. He's wonderful. He's amazing. A wonderful worship leader. Great creative mind. And I'm so thankful for him. Brother Austin, this podium is yours. Can you welcome Brother Austin tonight? Well, hello. (laughs) Uh, First, I want to thank Pastor for giving me this opportunity. I don't take it lightly, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of trust that's involved in uh, handing uh, a lesson over to somebody who you've not really heard um, speak before. (laughs) Uh, I hope that I get to do this again. Y'all just pray for me. Uh, So uh, I remember when I was a kid... um, like if, you know, we got up to sing as a child or we got up to testify or whatever. Uh, if you were kind of, um, if you were kind of acting nervous, you would kind of hear a church mother in the back somewhere saying, bless the Lord. And so uh, I, w- I wouldn't mind if I heard some bless him, Lord. Uh, and it might help me know if I'm doing good or doing bad. So. Uh, bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. I need it. Um, Also, my wife wanted me to mention that this is our family laptop, so that's why you see the stickers. Uh, (laughs) All right, lesson six. Who has enjoyed this uh, deep dive into the book of Acts that we've been going through this month? Hasn't it been great? Uh, I've not got to be in here for a lot of the lessons, but I have been listening back online. And if you haven't, you should too, because it's awesome. And it's uh, cool, I think, what you can catch when you're doing a deep dive more than just a casual read through, right? Uh, and in fact, in um, tonight, I'm covering, um, for the most part, chapter 8 and chapter 9. And there's a verse at the end uh, that says something about Philip was you know, quickened or, or taken away like like Elijah. Uh, and uh, when I was studying that, I said, Tevia, did you know that that happened in there? Because I had no, I've read 
through the Bible many times, and, you know, it's just a little blip, and if you blink, you're going to miss it. And she's like, yes, I did. Of course you did. She was a Bible quizzer, so she knows everything. <laughs> I know. Bless him, Lord. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so at the end of Sunday's lesson, uh, it was Brother Richard. He was talking about uh, the end of Acts. I want to do a really quick recap of Acts chapter 6 and 7. Um, so we see Stephen addressing the council, and he was brought before... He was brought before them on false charges of blasphemy against Moses and God. And these allegations were raised based on a false testimony because essentially the, the members of the synagogue of freedmen um, didn't like him because of the miracles that he was able to do and the miracles and signs um, that he was able to do through the name of Jesus. I love what the scripture says in Acts chapter 6 verse 10. When it says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. What a, what a powerful verse that is. Uh, I love it because uh, it's a great reminder that if we're armed with the knowledge of the Word of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, there's nothing the enemy can do to stand against us. Uh, but you can't use... The, the weapon of the word of God against the devil if you don't know it. Th this is why it's important to read and important to study and do these, uh, you know, listen when we're doing these studies. We move on to Acts chapter 6 and verse 15. It notes there that everyone there watching Stephen, oh, excuse me, everyone there was watching Stephen for a response and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Uh, show of hands, who would have a face of an angel if you're being accused by an angry mob? Not me. I don't think many of us could do that. But you know what? To me, that's a quick reminder that what you do with your face matters. You know, what, what he, his life, his face was telling a testimony before his words ever were. So, you know, it, it, it might be good to fix your face at times. <laughs> Ask yourself, what, what is your face telling? What testimony is your face telling? Uh, in Acts 7, uh, we see Stephen's response to the council uh, as they retell the story. Sorry. His response to the council is that he is retelling the story of Abraham Jacob, Joseph, and Moses, and relating it to God's covenant and to his people and his people's refusal to obey. He ends with this statement um, found in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 through 53. I'm going to read the NIV. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. I would hope that I could respond like Stephen did when, uh, with the truth when faced with an angry mob, but... I don't, I just don't think I would be using phrases like stiff-necked. But the truth, the truth is the truth, no matter how you slice it. Uh, we move on in Acts chapter 7, verse 54 through 56. Again, this is a recap, but I loved it so much that I wanted to put it in the lesson. Uh, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus was standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, I don't want you to be confused 
uh, by that statement, um, the right hand and standing beside. Because the right hand in Hebrew is actually an idiom meaning the place of power. So this isn't saying that Jesus is beside God or he's next to God. It's saying that Jesus is God. Now we can see this also in the Old Testament. If you look back to passages like Exodus 15 verse 6, it says, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. And now back into the New Testament, Matthew 28 verse 18 says, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now we jump uh, back into Acts chapter 7, verse 57 through 60. Uh, they removed Stephen from the city and they stoned him. And it's here where we're introduced to a young man named Saul uh, because he was collecting the coats of the angry mob. While being stoned, Stephen said, lay not this sin against their charge. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Because to me, it sounds a lot like when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's found in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It's interesting that the Bible says about Stephen that he fell asleep. Because this is not actually the first time that we see he fell asleep uh, in the Bible. Um, when Christians die, they don't die. They fall asleep. Uh, because Jesus didn't call death, death, uh, because it wasn't the end. And it's this for, for this reason that the early church didn't call it death either. We find this phrase in a few places in the New Testament as well. For example, John eleven eleven, it says, Lazarus sleeps. He was dead. Well, Jesus rose him. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 24, the young girl was not dead, but asleep. And now, we've made it through the recap, and now we're moving on into Acts chapter 8. Uh, here we see the persecution against the church being increased. But what's amazing about it is as the persecution increased, so does the spreading of the gospel. They don't let it stop them. And in, uh, in, in here we also see what Saul, uh, see more about Saul when, he, you know, he was introduced in the last chapter. Um, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 4 in the NIV says, And Saul approved of their killing him, Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So here we get a glimpse into what Saul was doing, and it wasn't good. Not only did he approve of the killing of Stephen, he co-signed. Now he's going house to house imprisoning Christians, he was literally wreaking havoc on the church. And as a result, the church was beginning to scatter. But I love what the scripture says in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. It says, those who had scattered preached the word wherever they went. So Saul, you couldn't stop them no matter who you were. Because wherever they go, they've got this fire burning in their heart. And they're taking the gospel with them because the gospel, oh, it's not in a place. It's not in a church. It's in the hearts of his people. And that can't be stopped. We take it wherever we go. Uh, that makes me actually think back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Samaria and to uttermost parts of the earth. That was a prophetic statement by Jesus, but I'm guessing that the disciples didn't know that. They probably never dreamed that it would happen through these kind of circumstances. They probably didn't imagine that, uh, that them preaching to all nations was going to be due to them being scattered because of persecution, right? 
later in a letter to the Roman church we see in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So, even if you find yourself in uncomfortable places, God is working it all for good. And there is a reason for your uncomfortable season. You can still evangelize even in your uncomfortable season. Now, one of these Christians that was scattered abroad was named Philip, who, like Stephen, had been one of the seven deacons appointed in Acts chapter 6. He ended up among the hated Samaritans, and he began preaching. So Philip goes to Samaria and begins preaching. We read in Acts chapter 8, verse 5 through 8, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with the palsy and who were lame sorry and that were lame were healed and there was a there was great joy in the city again being uncomfortable and being displaced doesn't mean that we have to be quiet Now, Philip is called an evangelist in Acts, uh, not because he ministered necessarily to saints, but because he won the sinners to the Lord. And remember, Philip is not even one of the leaders. I think if, if nothing else, that's a reminder that we're all called to be evangelists. And that's the first ministry of the church, evangelism, personal evangelism. Acts chapter 9, verse 9 through 13, Philip preaches and Simon the sorcerer believes and is baptized. Simon begins to journey with Philip as part of his ministry team. But when they believed they were baptized, there is, I want to read that again. Because the Bible says, but when they believed they were baptized, there's never belief without baptism. Baptism is the fulfillment or the action of the belief. Belief by itself is great and individual needs, you know, people need to believe. But belief alone does not complete God's plan of salvation. There's more to be done here. There's more steps. Mark chapter 16 verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So yeah, according to this, you have to believe and be baptized. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, we note that the first century church didn't believe that anyone who had received the Holy Spirit just because they had believed. The Samaritans had all believed and had been baptized, but the Bible is very clear that they did not yet receive the Holy Ghost. Also note that the first century church did believe that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was absolutely essential to salvation. That's why the apostles made the trip from Jerusalem, you know, when they should have been hiding, to lay hands on them that they might receive. Now we read in Acts chapter, oh, this is taking more time than I thought it would. I was expecting to look up and be like 10 minutes in. (laughs) Oh, anyway, sorry. I just surprised myself. Uh, So in Acts chapter 8, verse 18 through 25, we read, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, 
saying, give me also this power that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray for God and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So here Simon tries to buy the power that he sees when the apostles are laying hands on people when they receive the Holy Ghost. Now, this is, I, I think, this is kind of, you know, Simon was a sorcerer. And I think this is him trying, in, in his mind, maybe a little bit, trying to return to his sorcerer ways. He sees that they have power when they lay hands on people. He wants some of that. And he tries to buy it. Notice that he didn't ask for the power to do any of the miracles or signs he had seen. Because he realized that being filled with the Holy Ghost was the greater power. What did he observe that made him want this power so much? I believe it was speaking in tongues. And that is the New Testament pattern. Philip is now directed by the Lord to leave the crowd at his revival meetings and go out into the desert to meet with one person. It's interesting that we're often willing to do some big things for God, but reluctant to do small things. But this is not the spirit that the New, the New Testament church had. Um, I'll say that again because, you know, for me, as it relates to my life, sometimes it's so much easier to get up and worship in front of everybody and lead worship than it is to sometimes crack open my Bible on a Monday or Tuesday. You know, because our our mind, we just have to get it right. It's it's not in necessarily the big things, but the small things. Every soul is important. And remember, Philip, he isn't even one of the leaders here. Uh, the Bible says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. So a title, um, leadership, positions, it doesn't matter. The only thing, the only requirement is, is this sign is going to follow them that believe. The faith. This is what the calling of the church is. We're called to evangelize. And you never know who you're witnessing to or what God's going to eventually accomplish through that person. We see in Acts chapter 8, um, one of the people ministered to was the Ethiopian treasurer. In Acts chapter 9, it was a Pharisee named Saul. And another place in Acts chapter 9, it was a coat maker named Dorcas. In Acts chapter 10, it was a Roman centurion named Cornelius. In Acts chapter 14, it was an anonymous crippled man. In Acts chapter 16, it was a seller of cloth named Lydia. In Acts chapter 16, it was a, the Philippian jailer. In Acts chapter 18, it was a ruler of the synagogue named Crispus. In another place in Acts 18, it was Apollos, the eloquent preacher named Apollos. So you never know who your testimony is going to to impact and, and what impact that has down the line for someone else. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 29, we see that Philip meets an Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 8, verse 30 through 36, Philip hears him reading 
the book of Isaiah. And the eunuch doesn't understand, but Philip does, and he wants to shed, shed some light on the subject. They pass a place with water, and Philip baptizes the eunuch on the spot. It's interesting, uh, is the eunuch, when he was reading the Bible, and Philip overheard, was reading in Isaiah 53. And it's interesting to note that it doesn't say anything about being baptized or even about water in Isaiah 53. But notice that when the early church preached Jesus in the New Testament, it always involved baptism in Jesus' name. Always. The lesson Philip is trying to teach the church today is this. Minister where you've been placed. Bloom where you've been planted. And always preach Jesus. That's all Philip did. Uh, that's all the, the Church of Acts did. And that's all we have to do. When Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, it says that they both went down into the water. Um, they went down into the water. Immersion. Because uh, if you're getting sprinkled, you ain't, you're not going down into the water, are you? Sprinkling was not the method of baptism. Because you can't, you, they wouldn't have gotten down or into the water if that was the method. The Ethiopian eunuch would have, let me pause there, because this is a different thought and I'm connecting it. The, the Ethiopian eunuch would always have been treated as a second class citizen in the Jewish religion. According to Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, it says he was not allowed to enter into the congregation of the Lord. And yet he was so hungry for God that he traveled many miles to the temple in Jerusalem. And thank God he found the New Testament church. Because the New Testament church, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 through 29, for as many of you who have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. My goodness. Well, I'm so thankful to be a part of the New Testament church. Mm. You're one of his if you've been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Then, as I was talking about earlier, the little, um, the little thing I said earlier about Philip experiences a supernatural transport. I did not realize that happened in the Bible. Tevia did, though. She knew. Like I said, she was a Bible quizzer. Quick plug for Bible quizzing. She knows a lot. So the <laughs> less than one. That means move on. <laughs> uh, have you ever noticed that miracles, even outstanding ones in uh, the book of Acts, aren't that big of a deal? Uh, I noticed that while reading and studying that the, the miracles were kind of the, the second point. It's almost a means to an end. The miracles were a byproduct of God's power. And the point of all of the miracles was so that people would worship God. That people would come to know Jesus. So it was never really about the miracle itself. It was always about the res what happened because of the miracle to the people around Um, and I think sometimes we do get that backwards uh, in in today's church. We 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 pray to God for the miracle, 
the big thing, but we we aren't always as quick to to testify about it um, to sp- to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus after we get that miracle. Philip um, Philip wasn't again. He wasn't one of the leaders. He was just the right man at the right place the right time saying the right thing to the right person and again he wasn't even one of the leaders let me see how much more I have because I'm actually reading a lot slower than I thought I was I don't think I don't think you want that Uh, let's see okay Let's move quickly through let's, let's move quickly through Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> so, in Acts chapter 9 we see that Saul is still prosecuting Christians, threatening disciples and still arresting anyone he could find. Various details of Saul's life can be found in Acts chapter 9 um, 22 and chap, chap sorry, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. Um, some 30 years later Paul would write um, in Philippians three twelve through 14, that Christ had apprehended him and he was out to arrest others when the Lord arrested him. What a testimony. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul said, just as much as I pursued the church to persecute it, God was pursuing me to save me. And I'm so grateful that I'm now pursuing Christ with everything in me. I'm running after God's purpose. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 9, we um, see Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road. Probably a lot of you know it, but I'm going to read through it because why not? And And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and if it shall be told thee, sorry, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with him stood speechless. Because they heard the voice, sorry, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him with his hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he, neither did eat nor drink. So he says, who out there, who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. We see the name of Jesus being used here. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, Jesus is saying. I've been pricking your heart with the with the good of conviction, and you don't and if you don't repent, it's going to be hard for you. So no doubt Saul was instantly convicted by the memories of all the Christians he had persecuted. And because we know this because he asked, What wilt thou have me do? It shall be told thee what thee must do. Saul isn't saved yet. This is the same question they asked in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. They said, what must we do? In Acts chapter 9, verse 10 through 16, God gives Ananias a vision of Saul. For time's sake, I'm not going to read through that, but you will notice that the Lord told Saul, it will be told thee what you must do. And yet, In these scriptures, we don't see where the Lord tells Ananias what to tell Saul to do. Why is that? I believe that the omission only proves that as a New Testament believer, Ananias already knew exactly what to tell him that he needed to do to be saved. Because Peter had been preaching that in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. And, And that message is what the church continued to preach. 
Acts chapter 9, verse 17 through 18, Saul had already repented, and now Ananias tells him to be baptized and that he will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 9, verse 18 reads, no, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not reading through that, but it simply states that he arose and was baptized. So he heard what to do, and he did it. But later in Acts chapter 22, Paul recounts the exact words Ananias used when he spoke to him. Um, in a modern paraphrase, it was something like this. Um, what are you doing? Uh, get up and get baptized and have your sins washed away by having the name of the Lord called over you. Simple as that. In Acts chapter 9, verse 19 through 25, we see Saul stays with the disciples of Damascus and he immediately begins preaching the message of Jesus Christ. Those that heard him knew what he had, you know, done in the past, so they wanted to kill him. So now Saul's running for his life, um, and now actually he's converted and he's called Paul. New, his newfound friends sneak him out of the city, and Paul records in later writings that he spent many days alone in Arabia just seeking the Lord. What a conversion. Not many days before that, he was persecuting Christians, and now he's, he's uh, running from Christians because they're trying to persecute him. He continued to preach in this region, and uh, it was four, three years before he finally went to Jerusalem. I probably need to skip over some more things. Hmm. Well, he does later record some of the persecutions he faced during his early ministry. Uh, may be familiar to some of you. Forty stripes, five times. He was beaten with rods three times, stoned, um, shipwrecked three times. He was robbed. He was left in the wilderness. He was weary and in pain, hungry and thirsty, cold and naked. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 31, I do want to read this part. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in in the way, and he had spoken to him, and now he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. In 31, it says, Then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Never underestimate the impact of, of evangelism. And, and it could be even to some obscure you know, obscure person um, and never underestimate the impact of one converted sinner because that one sinner could be the key to many other souls. And I don't know, I think, of, I think about it like this. It's, um, you know, Saul clearly very passionate about whatever he believed. Um, when he was converted, he fought just as passionately for the gospel as he had fought against it. And, my goodness, the church needs that, don't we? So, never underestimate. Never never fail to evangelize or, or share that testimony with that person. Um, let's see. Okay, so in the last couple of verses of Acts, it kind of shifts focus. Um, and the attention 
shifts back to Peter, and he heals Ananias, who had been sick in bed eight years with palsy, and he raised a disciple named Tabitha from the dead. But again, in Acts, the attention is always less on the miracles and more on the effect of the miracles. Because the scripture here is clear when it says that people in the surrounding cities saw the miracles and turned to the Lord and believed in the Lord. And um, I think I'll wrap up with this. I, I was going to have Tevia come up and sing a song because I didn't think that I was going to speak this long. But um, but I do want to share this. It's something that I was listening to about evangelism today um, that I'd never, you know, there's some things that you never know you didn't think about it till you think about it. Um <laughs> And it, uh, a lot of times we're so, um, at least for myself, so hesitant to share my testimony, um, you know, for whatever reason. But um, I was listening to um, a podcast today, and the man was talking about, um, he was trying to um, witness to this, this woman, and he didn't have anything in his personal testimony that was really applicable but um he he decided to share with her the testimony his wife had shared with him of her life and he was able to to win this soul through sharing someone else's story so i guess i want to encourage you today uh when you're evangelizing when you're telling people about Jesus and what Jesus did for you, please understand that the story isn't just for the person that you're speaking to. It's, it's these testimonies live on in eternity. And this testimony that you've shared with that person down the road, can they can share with someone else of what God did for you, even if God's not done that personally for them. The testimony lives on. And, and so if you're hesitant, like myself, to share your testimony, because, you, th- uh, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you're, you're ashamed or, or whatnot, I want to encourage you and myself today to, um, to evangelize because it's not, again, not just the person that you're talking to that receives your testimony, but it's anybody that they decide to share that testimony with because now they know of the goodness of God through your life and they can share that with others even if they don't have that themselves yet well I guess I need to wrap up so I just want to if we could all stand we're going to end in prayer (coughs) I guess that's a pretty abrupt ending and I apologize I didn't have that planned but God is good I think I think the I think the main message uh, that we take away from these verses that I'm taking away from these verses today is that um, you know the the Bible is clear about the pattern for salvation. There wasn't belief without baptism, um, for one, but also the importance of evangelizing where you are. And I believe with all my heart that God has called all of us to evangelize where we can, and it doesn't look the same for everybody. You know, it doesn't, it may not be, you know, running out to the street corner with a, with a bullhorn and, you know, telling people your story. Um, but it could be sharing, you know, privately sharing with someone your testimony about what God's done. So um, my prayer tonight for all of us as we leave is going to be that God will make us evangelists. That God will give us um, a surety in our testimony that God will give us bravery in our testimony and, uh, and that we won't be afraid to share our story with someone who needs it, our story of God's goodness. Dear Lord, we come before you tonight and we thank you for this time that we've been able to come together and learn from your word and, and study and grow. Jesus, I just want to ask that you touch every soul in this room. Dear Lord, give us bravery. Give us passion in our hearts for you. Dear Lord, so that we can share 
the gospel with someone and our testimony with someone. We can share our story with someone and impact the kingdom. Dear Lord, the kingdom can grow because of the words that we speak. And Jesus, we just ask that you move in our hearts today. Give us a, a deeper passion for you and for truth. In Jesus' name we pray. And dear Lord, as, as we leave, we ask that you keep us safe until we can meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all? <laughs> All right, I did it. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna meet again uh, on Sunday at nine a.m. and we're gonna continue this series. I'm not sure who this speaker is, but I know it's not me. And uh, oh, it's at five. The notes. My bad. My bad. There will be no teaching on Sunday. You'll have to come next time. <laughs> In Jesus' name, y'all have a good night.